My name is Faye Lang, and I'm currently working at Georgetown University Hospital in the Department of Radiology in Washington, D.C., where I am part of the abdominal imaging section and professor of radiology. Uh, today, we will be talking about ultrasound of the ovary, to worry or not to worry. Today we're going to talk about the ovary. I just want to say a, a brief hello again. And um, some of you may know that I recently moved to Georgetown uh, or to Washington, D.C., beautiful city. We see Thomas Jefferson. And this is actually where I work now in Georgetown University Hospital. Um, it's on the campus of a beautiful university. This is part of the university, one of the buildings. and. Um, Georgetown, if you've not visited it, is a very special place. It's in our, obviously in our nation's capital. A lot of people live in these beautiful big homes. Um, I'm lucky I could afford something a little more uh, modest, as we see here, and I'm having a great time in Washington, D.C. Before I was in Georgetown, I worked in Boston for 18 years, where I was up at Harvard. And some of you may recognize this um, logo from Harvard, very formal, very fancy. So I thought when I went to Georgetown, I should replace it with an equally beautiful logo from Georgetown University Hospital. So I went searching, and the best I could come up with was Jack the Bulldog, who is um, a very big favorite on the campus uh, of this university. So I urge you, if you can, come and visit us. So today we're going to talk about ultrasound of the ovary, whether or not we should worry. Of course, we want to feel secure as we're doing our um, imaging, not feel that we are hanging on for dear life by our fingertips, and um, we'd like to be up here with our friends. Fortunately, most women who we examine have normal ovaries, and here we have the sort of index appearance to an ovary with a beautiful ovoid shape, small peripheral follicles, and um, this is what we would love to see in all patients. But we know that not uncommonly things happen in the ovary. And it's very important that we are able to recognize things that happen to the ovary that are either worrisome or, as in the majority of patients, the great majority, things that are not worrisome. And we're going to stress this in the discussion that we are going to have in the next few minutes. Of course, sometimes we see things in the ovary that are clearly disturbing as in this nice diagram or a schematic scene. Uh, all of these come, by the way, from Dr. Netter and his group, Frank Netter, to which I want to give a, a, a big thank you. So it's very important when we're starting to do our scans. We typically begin our abdominal scans. We begin with an abdominal scan and then often go to a vaginal scan to know the patient's history. Now this woman came in, clearly had a palpable mass on more than a single occasion. And I think it's very easy when you look at a scan like this to say, you don't see anything significant. There's a little bit of fluid in the pelvis here, which is not uncommonly seen and is not necessarily a problem. But what is more difficult in this case is to realize that that is not the bladder. That is an ovarian cyst that mimics the bladder. As a matter of fact, there is the bladder. In this patient, it's not well distended. So how do you find that you don't get yourself in trouble? Because to miss a 10 centimeter ovarian cyst for a sonologist would truly be in an embarrassing situation. The first thing I'd like to stress is to know the history of the patient. If somebody consistently feels a mass and you're only seeing one ovary, you don't see an ovary on that side, be concerned that perhaps you're dealing with a mimicker for the bladder, in which case this would be the ovarian cyst. The second thing is, if I was doing a scan like this, I'd say to the woman, now empty your bladder, I'm going to do a vaginal scan. But you quickly, she'll tell you that she just did empty her bladder and it's empty. So there's a mismatch here. You could get out of this problem and solve it in several ways. One is you could ask the woman to drink a lot of water to try to fill up her bladder, make sure this isn't the bladder. You could also put a Foley catheter in. But what I like to do is when I'm doing my vaginal scan, every time I put the transducer in, 
I can see the urethra. And the urethra, of course, is a landmark because it will connect to the bladder. And you'll quickly recognize this to be the bladder and that to be separate from it. And so there's nothing intrusive uh, to the patient in terms of discomfort like a Foley catheter or discomforting like filling her bladder to get it very distended. So I urge you to remember this case. Be aware of mimickers. There are many others that you can see, as we see here, being pointed to by the various arrows. And what these are in the, these particular cases, we're dealing with bowel vessels and even fibroids that can mimic the ovary. So how do you obviate the problems here? One is a real-time scan is certainly a good way to bail yourself out because bowel should peristalsis. So if you compress it with the probe, you'll see that bowel will compress and maybe you'll start peristalsis. Vessels, you could either put color flow on, as we see here, but typically these are small veins that have flow in them. And if you were to just turn up your gain setting, you will see the slow flow, the echoes move slowly within these veins. And also, of course, you can compress them with the probe, similar to how you do a DVT study, compressing the veins. So the main thing is to recognize that these are not, this isn't the ovary, and sometimes these veins can mimic follicles. So be aware of this and solve the situation. Go elsewhere, look for the vessel, look for the ovary. Now this case is probably the most problematic because I think it really does look like an ovary. But you can see I'm taking the probe and I'm blotting by the uterus and this structure sticks with the uterus. Therefore it's part of the uterus and therefore it would be a sub serosal fibroid. So once you recognize this, take your picture and then move elsewhere to find the ovary. Now I begin all my scans transabdominally as I showed you in the initial case with that pseudo ovary, pseudo bladder due to the ovary. Here's another example, big mass in the pelvis which would most likely be a fibroid which is what it is. But the question is at this point can I find an ovary? And many people give up very quickly saying, I'll never find an ovary with such a big mass, as in this case with a big fibroid. And I would like to urge you not to have this attitude. Because when there's a big mass in the pelvis, the ovary typically goes in one of two places. One is it's moved superior to the side, so lateral, and superficial. So that's up, out, and superficial. Or if it's not there, it may be located deep in the pelvis. So what I would do at this point is change my transducer to one that could see better superficially and I'd go looking for the ovary. So in this case, we changed to a curved probe, a higher megahertz, this being six, the other being four. Harmonics is on to get rid of the noise. You can compress with this probe and sure enough, we see two normal appearing ovaries. And at this point, the study is probably finished because you're not gonna see this uterus better with a vaginal scan. Had I not seen the ovaries, however, I would have proceeded to do a vaginal scan to see if I could find the ovaries deep in the cul-de-sac. But the main thing, or in the pelvis, the main thing I would like to stress is don't give up and say I can't find the ovaries in a patient who has a large pelvic mass because you will be rewarded if you know where and how to find them. Now what I'd like to focus a large part of this lecture on is an approach to women who have cysts in their ovary because most things that happen to the ovary are cystic. And I would like to suggest that if you have one of these six conditions, which I will call the big six, they're all common, benign, and recognizable, you are gonna be able to see at least 90 to 95% of the conditions that affect the ovaries, and you'll know what to do with them. And this is obviously important because in, these situ in this situation, all of these conditions are benign. So we've already mentioned that what happens to the ovary is it develops cysts. Far and away, the most common cysts that develop are the physiologic cysts associated with the normal menstrual cycle or sometimes the cycle goes, becomes a bit confused and you no longer have a normal cycle. And this is because of the associated hormones, typically estrogen and progesterone, 
that cause the cycle to become abnormal and you develop what we call functioning ovarian cysts. So far and away, these are the most common. Now, again, thanks to Dr. Netter's beautiful diagram, we can see what happens to an ovary in a cycle. Immediately after, after uh, menses, there are no dominant follicles, but by the time day 14 rolls around, we develop a follicle that is typically larger than the others and has the egg or cumulus within it. After ovulation, we then develop the corpus luteum. Whenever I do a gynecologic scan, I always ask the patient two questions. One, when was your last period? And two, are you on hormones? Because I want to tie what I see on the ultrasound exam to what her responses are relative to where she is in her cycle. And I know that follicles become their largest just prior to ovulation. They can become as large as 30 millimeters and they're associated with estrogen production. And here we have case number one on day 14 showing a follicle with a little cumulus. So how do I report this? Well, this is a normal finding for this woman. We'll talk about in a minute an, a recently published consensus as to how we should address this situation. Now, right after ovulation, you develop the corpus luteum. And I put the word cyst here in quotations because as we can see, that cyst quickly involutes to become more or less solid looking. But we need to recognize them. They also can be up to about 30 millimeters and are associated with progesterone production. And here we have case number two of a corpus luteum immediately after ovulation or shortly thereafter. Notice the thick, irregular, crenulated wall. If I was to put color on this, there would be flow within that wall with a low resistance pattern. As the follicle matures, it involutes, becomes more solid looking, and if you were to put duplex on, you would see the color is only in the periphery with a low resistance flow that in every way can mimic a neoplastic flow pattern. But be careful because if the history and the appearance on the grayscale are consistent with a corpus luteum, this is a normal finding in a woman who is ovulating. Now sometimes the cycle doesn't continue normally. You may fail to ovulate, you may fail to involute a corpus luteum, or you may hemorrhage into it. In which case you may end up with what we call a functioning ovarian cyst. And the word functioning implies there is an excessive amount of hormone in the neighborhood, progesterone or estrogen for the corpus luteum and the follicle um, respectively. So starting with a follicle, a functioning follicle is one that is greater than the three centimeters that I talked about before. And you may, it would be in a patient who often may fail to ovulate and you're left with this large follicle cyst or functioning follicle. The corpus luteum may hemorrhage, it may even um, the ovary or the cyst may actually um, rupture and you can get even a large hemoperitoneum in association with these functioning corpus luteal cysts. So here we have a functioning follicle, it measures roughly 3 by 5 centimeters, it's simple and given time, usually a few months, this should involute. Here we have one of the appearances for a hemorrhagic corpus luteum. This is associated with increased progesterone and also given a few months, this will involute. The third kind of functioning cyst seen here where we see multiple large peripheral cystic structures or follicles and these are seen in certain conditions where there are, is a milieu of increased HCG on board and these are follicles then that are stimulated and all follicles live in the periphery pretty much of the ovary. So that's what these are and they're stimulated by the HCG to get large. In a patient who has, and you need the history here, either been given HCG in an effort to become pregnant, perhaps overshot the mark and had the development of a multifetal pregnancy in which case each placenta will in itself elaborate HCG, so again an excessive amount of HCG on board to stimulate the ovary, or a patient who has one form or another of gestational trophoblastic disease, 
uh, such as a classic mole, or even down the range of these conditions to choriocarcinoma. People who have too much HCG on board, I'm sure you know, can be prone to have fluid collections in the way of ascites, pleural effusions, or even pericardial effusions. These patients are treated depending upon the etiology for their fecal lutein cysts, and in many cases, particularly the top two, it's watchful waiting. So in late 2009, a group of many um, people with great experience in ultrasound and interest in ultrasound convened with the Society of Radiologists and Ultrasound meeting for a two-day consensus conference addressed to what we should do with ovarian cysts. This was in late 2009 in Chicago. And Debbie Levine, who's currently one of the editors of Radiology, um, wrote the paper that has now been published in at least three places that I know of. Uh, one is Ultrasound Quarterly, another is Radiology, and the third one, I believe, is in the gynecologic literature. And basically, we're trying to disseminate this information, as I said, from experts in radiology, sinologists, gynecologists, pathologists, so many, and, and statisticians, so many people who are interested in the business of what to do with many of these cysts. So what they addressed and said with respect to premenopausal cysts, what do you do about them in terms of follow-up? Their suggestion is if it's a simple looking cyst, three centimeters or less, probably don't even need to report it and certainly don't need to get a follow-up because these are normal physiologic cysts seen with the normal menstrual cycle. Now, what's confusing is if you see a cyst in other organs like the liver or the kidney, that's not normal. But I want to emphasize the point made by many of us at that conference, cysts are normal in the ovary. And so if it's normal, don't mention it. But make sure you know the patient's history with respect to one, when was your last period, and two, are you on hormones? And knowing where you are in the cycle, and assuming the history is she's not on hormones, you should be able to figure out if you're dealing with a physiologic follicle. If it's between three and five centimeters, it's probably going to be a functioning follicle, in which case you know it should disappear in a period of a few months. The people who are addressing this meeting agreed that we should put this in the report, but no need to follow it since they should go away. It's only those larger cysts, somewhere between five and seven centimeters, that should undergo a yearly follow-up. And we'll talk more about um, this again as we continue in this lecture. But seven centimeters appears to be the recent newly announced cutoff for when we should start to intervene, perhaps because of the threat of torsion when things get that large. A hemorrhagic cyst should be treated in the same way as a physiologic follicle in that the small ones we can ignore in terms of follow-up, perhaps report the larger ones, but they too should disappear within a period of a few months. The larger ones, probably a good idea to get a short interval follow-up because sometimes these hemorrhagic cysts can mimic endometriomas. There's a crossover in their appearance and just to make sure that they do go away then. So um, it would be a good idea then to, to follow these. If they stayed, entertain the thought of an endometrioma. Now, what about the large group of patients who have non-neoplastic cysts? And certainly we'll talk about neoplasms. What we want to talk about with non-neoplastic cysts are these three, postmenopausal, polycystic ovaries, and go into more detail with respect to hemorrhagic processes that could include endometriomas and hemorrhagic cysts. So let's start with postmenopausal women who have cysts in their ovary. The first thing I would like to do is put color on and make sure, ah, there we are, dealing with a cyst in the ovary. The other fluid collection was just a vessel. Point one is that postmenopausal ovaries, whether you're on hormones or not, should not be terribly vascular. So note whether they are or not, and hopefully they won't be. Now, many articles have been published about postmenopausal cysts, and the, the first one was, again, Debbie Levine. She was either a medical school student or a radiology resident at this point in time 
who noted a large number of postmenopausal cysts and commented that cancer did not develop in any case. And this has been subsequently shown in other literature that has been published. Um, and these cysts have been measured as five centimeters or less in diameter. Uh, the article that Dr. Levine wrote noted a 17% incidence, subsequent articles a lower incidence, possibly because of the size of these cysts. If you measure every teeny little fluid collection, you will have a higher incidence. But most of these, or I'd say about half of these, are going to resolve within the next year or two should you follow up these cysts. The consensus statement suggests, because they're so common to see small cysts in postmenopausal women, that if they are a centimeter or less, probably should not follow them up and consider even not reporting them. As again, you start mentioning the word cyst, these people will come back to you. And since these are benign, um, non-threatening condition, don't need to follow them up. Between one and all the way up to seven centimeters, uh, the consensus statement said definitely to uh, report this and then consider doing a yearly follow-up. Many of these cysts are going to stay stable in size or grow very, very slowly, which is the why the uh, thoughts were that they don't need to be reported. But once you get to be maybe seven centimeters, uh, because of the threat of possible torsion at that point, you might want to consider removing these cysts. And seven centimeters and above, again, the idea would be to either remove them. I'm not sure how MRI would add to the ultrasound in terms of saying what this is, but um, most of us, I think, were in the, in the um, mindset to consider doing surgery at that point. Well, what about number four on our list of common, treatable, uh, common benign conditions that are seen in the ovary? If you see a large number of small peripheral, these would be the location of follicles, as we see in the picture here, uh, people have uh, described these as looking like a string of pearls around a woman's neck, this is consistent with a polycystic ovary. Now, a consensus statement came out a few years ago with these numbers, more than 12 peripheral follicles, none of which is greater than 10 millimeters, and the ovary is slightly enlarged, usually round. I find all these numbers a bit confusing to remember, so I would like to suggest an easy way to remember a polycystic ovary is using that rule of 10. If you have 10 follicles, you're probably going to have 12 and more, um, because there are many at the periphery none of which have a diameter of greater than 10 millimeters, and the ovary is somewhat enlarged, having a volume of greater than 10 cubic centimeters. To diagnose a polycystic ovary, the consensus statement said it only needed to affect a single ovary. Now, in my report, I don't report these as polycystic ovarian syndrome. That is a clinical entity with amenorrhea, hirsutism, and often obesity and abnormal endocrine function, increased androgen and LH. So my job is to define what the ovary looks like, and I would call this a polycystic ovary, and let the clinician figure out if this is part of the spectrum of polycystic ovarian syndrome. These ovaries are often scanned by us because patients are manipulated because they're anovulatory in an effort to get pregnant. And these ovaries are very uh, sensitive to hormonal manipulation. These are the people who not uncommonly develop ovarian hyperstimulation, which we've shown you an example of with the thecaludean cysts. Interestingly, even though these women are amenorrheic, they have a very vascular stroma, particularly in the center of the ovary, with a low resistance pattern. And I find this rather intriguing because when women are typically anovulatory, and the most common reason for that would be a case like this, multiple small follicles throughout the ovary in an avascular ovary, the most common appearance or reason women will have an ovary like this is a woman on oral contraception. Um, and I don't know why these women are so vascular in their ovaries, but when I see what looks like a polycystic ovary, I always turn on my flow and see if it's a hypervascular ovary. And more than likely, if it is, it will be a polycystic ovary. Now, moving into another entity, which is very common and classic, is the woman who has a 
homogeneously echogenic mass in the ovary, sometimes hard to see if the echogenicity of it is similar to the background of the ovary, and you can see some small follicles here peripherally. Turning on this case, you can see actually there's a fluid debris level. Not always going to have that, but not uncommonly with a dependent debris level. Notice the fluid debris looks vertically, and that is not because the woman is in an unusual position. It's just because whenever we look at a vaginal scan, as we see in this case, the front of the probe is always put on the top of the screen. So this actually is the patient's feet, her head, anterior and posterior. So it's an anterior, posterior fluid debris level. Um, if you were to put color on in this entity, which is a classic for endometrioma, you can see a little bit of movement with the uh, Doppler, or, or, I'm sorry, with the color on. But when we put Doppler on, notice how we've increased the flow greatly in that endometrioma. And this is to remind me to tell you, of course, that Doppler has increased energy and that's why we're striking these echoes more forcibly, causing them to have this kind of motion. And I urge you when you see such a thing to be reminded, if you're doing pregnancy-related scanning, particularly in the first trimester, I am definitely not a fan of using Doppler at that point because of delivering higher energy to a developing embryo. So. I would urge you to not use Doppler unless you have a very good reason to do so. And honestly, I, for many years, I have not found that good reason um, in my early pregnancy studies. But let's get back to endometriomas. Most women who have endometriosis know their diagnosis. And what is the most common ultrasound appearance in a woman who comes in saying, I know I have endometriosis? Most commonly, it's a normal ultrasound study because they will not have a focal endometrioma. So don't be surprised to see a normal study. When a woman develops an endometrioma, it typically occurs within the ovary, and we've just shown you what they look like. They're masses that are filled with low-level homogeneous echoes. What did the consensus statement say about endometriomas? It was said that initially we should do a follow-up in about anywhere between 6 and 12 weeks, and why would that be? Because we want to make sure that really is an endometrioma, in which case it will not change appreciably or it won't go away. And there is, as we said, a crossover between endometriomas and hemorrhagic cysts, which should go away, hence the short-term follow-up. But then the consensus people also suggested we do a yearly follow-up just to keep our eye on these things. They should not go away and they may grow a little bit slowly. But if there's an appreciable change in the size, probably should be removed because there is, unfortunately, an association in women with chronic endometriomas to subsequently tr uh, trans, trans uh, or change the appearance and become malignant in the way of developing an endometrioid carcinoma. So that's why we want to keep our eye on women with endometriomas. Now, most endometriomas look the same, but occasionally we have an, one of them that looks different from the rest of the gang. So here's an example of a slightly atypical endometrioma, much coarser echoes. And here's one that frankly looks very, very atypical with mural nodules, thickening of the wall, septations, and even flow in the septations. When I see something like this, even if a woman has a history of endometriosis, I'm going to be concerned. In this case, to the point that if I get concerned, then the clinician will get concerned along with the patient, and it will be removed surgically. And this was proven to be an endometrioma. So I'm showing you a spectrum. Fortunately, this is a, an unusual situation. Here we have a typical endometrioma in this woman, and subsequently, follow-up showed it looks very different looks more like a hemorrhagic cyst that's evolving. But in this case, this went back and forth over time, subsequently being surgically proven to just be an endometrioma. And what I think happens here is these women cyclically will bleed into the endometrioma, and the blood products may evolve as a hemorrhagic cyst, but only to hang around for the long term, become low-level homogeneous echoes, as we see here. Occasionally, you may see something like this. 
and the wall of the bladder. Now, I'm not saying this is not, you can't tell this from a bladder neoplasm, but a woman who has a history of endometriosis, and particularly if she has cyclic hematuria, you might want to think about the possibility that this is an endometrial implant in the wall of the bladder, as we see here through a cystoscope. This is an interesting lady who does have endometriosis, and I'll show you her endometrium in a minute, but complained about pain near her umbilicus. And of course, if somebody's complaining about pain, it's my job, I believe, to go see if I can help find out what's going on. So we saw this mass near her umbilicus, and we saw it again a while later that it was even getting bigger, now sort of bilobed, and she had endometriosis and endometriomas in her uterus, I'm sorry, in her pelvis, in her ovaries. And we can see a homogeneous, very typical appearing endometriomas. So what is causing this mass up by her umbilicus? When we looked at this patient with a real-time clip, you can see this is in the abdominal wall right next to her umbilicus. So what this represents is an endometrial implant in the scar thanks to a laparoscopy that was done. And I've seen certainly endometriomas in this location. I've seen them in C-section and other scars. And endometriosis can have a way of implanting far away from the ovary and often will be cyclically painful as there's hemorrhage into these unusually located endometriomas. Now, if you look at this next case, there are very, there's a very hyperechogenic area occupying the majority of the ovary that is avascular. It doesn't have the typical appearance of the low-level homogeneous echoes of the endometrioma, but it's avascular. And this woman, in all likelihood, is acutely symptomatic at this point because she has hemorrhaged into a cyst, i.e. into a corpus luteum. And these can be very, very painful. And this is what the acute hemorrhage should look like. These are going to go away with time, a period of months, and uh, we shouldn't worry about them. So I mentioned ovarian cancer does a lot of things, but it rarely hemorrhages. So if you see what looks like something that could be hemorrhage, if you elect to follow it, and not everybody does today, according to our consensus statement, it should resolve. But if you were to follow it, these hemorrhagic cysts evolve often in a predictable manner. One way they evolve is to develop a retraction of clot, as we see in these two examples. Now, you might say to yourself, why is this not a mural nodule with a tumor? Well, for one thing, it is avascular, and tumors are typically vascularized. So, can we do anything else? Another case, avascular, probably a hemorrhagic cyst with a clot in, in evolution. Now, I know that if I have a clot, it is going to be relatively soft and what I like to do at this point is take the transducer and push against it to see if it's soft, if I can get it to jiggle. And this is one of my favorite clips where I show this clot moves and jiggles, and tumor doesn't behave like this. If I have a tumor and you look at a clip, you can see this is much firmer, doesn't move, and of course this woman also has ascites. If I was to show you what color looks like, in a minute, this is a mural nodule because it is firm, And um, but if I showed you what it looked like with color, it is going to be vascularized in contrast to a cystic structure with a hemorrhage in it that is evolving. So mural nodules should be separable from hemorrhagic ovarian cysts in evolution. But don't get fooled. Keep your eyes open. And um, if there's any question, of course, get that short-term follow-up. Now another thing that hemorrhagic clot can do as it's evolving is it can form these reticulated appearing masses, and I think Eclipse says it better than me, where these lines are avascular. And the point I want to emphasize is your terminology. This S word, or septation, I think should be avoided if possible. Because clinicians see something or read something in their report that says the word septation, there is a knee-jerk 
that they would suggest that that represents a tumor because tumors are often septated. So I would urge you not to use that word if possible. There are many other adjectives and descriptive terms you can use, such as it's a reticulated process. It is sponge-like. Perhaps consider the word cobweb in appearance, but if you're going to use the word septation, say they are fine. You might want to say they're fine linear echoes as opposed to septation to avoid the word septation in your report, which could be confusing to a clinician. So now we've talked about the varying and common non-neoplastic cystic conditions. I'd like to talk about two others before we turn our attention to neoplasm. What about ovarian torsion? Well, as the name implies, it's a twisting of an ovarian pedicle, and often there are tumors or cystic structures within that ovary to predispose to the twist. Similar to testicular torsion, these occur in young women. And some of these women may have loose ligaments that predispose them to twist. Now, there are many ultrasound features that have been published, but I would like to emphasize the two that I think are very important and go hand in hand is in an enlarged ovary in an unusual location. I would like to suggest that I have never seen a normal size and appearing ovary that is actively torsed because that doesn't seem to occur. Also, you might consider looking for the twisted pedicle that's involved with the torsion and consider what the blood flow looks like. We will address these. So when I'm dealing with a patient who I'm considering the possibility of torsion, let's look at a couple of examples. These are both transabdominal scans. Notice each have a mass in the midline located very unusually anterior to the uterus. That is not the location where an, ovar an ovary should be located. I'm not saying it never can be, but this is distinctly unusual. And in a woman who has pain over this enlarged ovary, clearly both have masses, Located in this location, I would be very concerned about a torsion, and indeed, in these this two situations, these were torsed ovaries located anterior to the uterus. But you can also torse and end up deep in the pelvis in a location posterior to the uterus, and if not, in the contralateral adnexa. As we see in this patient, whose left ovary on a vaginal scan is going behind the uterus into the right adnexa. Notice the leading edge with the assist. In this case, both ovaries are located to the same side of the uterus. They're both on the right side with respect to the uterus. Very unusual. And this case also had a leading edge. And these ovaries were tender, unusually located deep in the pelvis, and therefore very compatible with a torsion. Now, the pedicle that leads or feeds its blood supply to the ovary, there are two sources of blood flow to the ovary, unlike a man who only has a single testicular artery. There's the ovarian artery here and a branch of the uterine artery here. So the ovary having a dual blood supply, you can imagine you could torse one of these blood supplies and maintain flow to the ovary from the opposite uh, ovarian vessel that's feeding the ovary. <coughs> So it's important to recognize that, point number one, the dual blood supply. Point number two, these normal pedicles that feed the ovary are straight. We see that nicely in this case because we have uh, fluid around the, the pedicle. So typically a pedicle in either side should be straight. When you have a torsion, as the name implies, you will twist the pedicle, and this has been termed the whirlpool sign. So either of these could twist with a torsion. And what they look like through a laparoscope is a twist, or as we affectionately like to note, a whirlpool based on the ultrasound appearance. So look for the torsed pedicle. And here we have a case where on the grayscale clip you can see it looks like a whirlpool, a twist. And there's the leading edge to the ovary here that's twisted. If I just do a steady state, not moving the probe on my um, clip, you can see there is blood flow in here and it looks like a whirlpool or twist. Very important to look for that and if you see it, you can make the diagnosis of a torsion. Don't think the CT added a whole lot. 
Now here's a challenge case. This lady comes in with an enlarged ovary located deep in the cul-de-sac and it was tender. And by the way, you often will get a history of when women will torse, they will give you a history just like a man does, that they have had intermittent torsion and subsequently when they come into the ER, the pain becomes overwhelming. And so intermittent pain is not uncommon because I think many of these people have a lax ligament that allows their ovary to intermittently twist. When they come in with a severe pain, by the way, they're often vomiting, and that seems to go hand in hand with torsion. That's been published as one of the clinical appearances that, we're, that people have when they torse. So what's interesting to me about this case is notice there is both arterial and venous blood flow. Now it's been said that when women torse, the ovary swells and you cut off the venous blood supply. So in this case, you can see arterial and venous blood flow. So what did we do in this situation? Well, I couldn't ignore her history of intermittent pain and now it's much worse. Her ovary was tender. And when I looked in her pelvis, I knew this was deep in the cul-de-sac. I was worried. So I got on the phone and I called the clinician and I said, I think this woman has torsed her ovary even though there's good blood flow. And I urged the surgeon to bring the patient to the OR sooner rather than later because if the torsion tw uh, got any tighter she might cut off the blood supply to that ovary and it might necrose. And uh, the surgeon was so gratified when he went to the OR and saw that this was a viable ovary. That's very important. Obviously by the time it's necrotic and dead there's nothing you can do but take it out. So here's another case that's an important challenge case. We see the left ovary is slightly bigger than the right, the follicles are smaller, they're being pushed to the periphery of the ovary, and this woman's tender over that left ovary. All worrisome for an acute ovarian torsion. Furthermore, when we look transabdominally, we realize that the ovary is in an unusual location deep in her cul-de-sac. So, so far everything is great in line for an acute torsion of the ovary. If you look at the, uh, the clip here, it looks like there's a pedicle that may be torsing, at least to a certain degree. The ovary is large and swollen. But when we put color on here, notice there is hyperemia to that ovary. Certainly not lack of flow, but increased flow. So the question is, why is the flow so hyperemic? Well, as we mentioned, ovaries can torse and then they can detorse. And in the process of detorsing, also known as mistorsion, you can suddenly have a period of hyperemia that's transient. And if you can see it like this, you can suggest this ovary has just detorsed. So what should happen clinically to a patient like this? It's very important to get this woman to the operating room because she's going to be at risk to torse again. Take her to the operating room and just do a a, a pexy, if you will, or tack the ovary down so she will not have the ominous complication of a subsequent torsion. And certainly you might want to look at the other ovary as well because often these lax ligaments are bilateral. Now what about women who have these multiple small echogenic foci typically at the periphery of the ovary as a dotted or even a very linear appearance in this more dramatic example? Do you worry or not worry when you see this. We certainly know that if we see these little echogenic foci and you're dealing in a testicle, you would be labeled as having testicular microlithiasis and there has clearly been a reported association of this with testicular neoplasm. So it's the same thing true in a woman who has these little microliths. These are small, non-shadowing, and as we said, about 95% are in the periphery of the ovary. So you recognize them, and I will quickly tell you not to worry about these. A study came out of the Brigham Hospital, Rusty Brown, one of my colleagues, took ovaries like this, and when they were gonna be removed, we had the opportunity to look at these ovaries vis-a-vis -vis the pathologic specimen, and so you can see this little tiny calcification in association with the small peripheral cyst. These are called inclusion cysts, which are things that happen after ovulation. So it's sort of a remnant of prior ovulation. Here's a very dramatic example again. It looks like a rim calcification can even be seen on a CT scan 
and at pathology, we can see hundreds and hundreds of these little cysts with these echogenic foci representing the microcalcification. So this is a condition where it's not something we need to worry about. Most commonly, these are calcifications associated with inclusion cysts or prior ovulation. There have been other conditions, not as common, but we do not worry about these because these are not pre-malignant lesions. And I would suggest if you do put this in the report, and there's a question whether you need to, but if you do, please be clear in the report to say this is not a worrisome finding. Now sometimes these little calcifications can get bigger. We followed them actually up to 13 millimeters, and only one of these cases went to surgery, and that proved to be a corpora albicans, or basically a scar in the ovary uh, due to a prior ovulation. And uh, a report was published based on these cases. There were 28 cases. The bottom line is, these do not change with time, and therefore we do not worry about them. There's no mass associated with them, so these are not dermoids. And if you see such a finding, if you want to follow it, follow it maybe for a year, and then don't worry about it, because this is not going to be, a, you know, we're worried about cancer. So coming up to the subject of neoplasm, we can see that ovarian tumors are very, very deadly. If you summate the mortality of them vis-a-vis -vis the other gynecologic neoplasms being uterine or cervical, it more than summates those other two gynecologic neoplasms. So although, fortunately, it's not all that common, halfway between cervical and uh, uterine cancer, um, unfortunately, these are very malignant tumors. And if you look how we've done with imaging and talking about ultrasound over the years, in terms of lessening the mortality, that we have not done. If anything, mortality is higher than ever. So it is a really a terrible condition to have and uh, something that fortunately is not too common, but we should recognize it. Now, ovarian neoplasms come in four different types, as we can see here, from the least common sex cord, sex cord stromal tumors to the epithelial tumors. Let's start with sex cord stromal tumors. As the name implies, these arise from the stroma of the ovary, or the scaffolding, in which, if you, would, if you will, which contain the uh, germ cells and the epithelial tissue that form other kinds of neoplasms. So this comes from the stroma of the ovary. They come in three different types. The most common is the granulosa cell tumor, and these are all solid. Two of these tumors, are associated with hormone production, the granulosa tumor with estrogen, and the sertoliclite with androgen production. So if you have a postmenopausal patient and she suddenly has symptoms, maybe she's getting her period again, that sound like she's got feminizing um, hormone on board, she probably has a granulosa cell tumor, and in contrast, if masculizing symptoms appear, you're going to think about a sertoliclite lytic tumor. Fibromathecoma is the third tumor that develops from the stromal elements of the ovary. And it, as every medical student knows, is associated with Meg syndrome, which I've seen all of two cases, I think, in my 40-year career. And these are patients who have effusions with a benign tumor, ascites, pleural effusions, pericardial effusions, and these are benign. The other two tumors, fortunately, have low malignant potential, grade one, tumors, so these are not wildly anaplastic the way the epithelial tumors are. What about these cases? Two different patients with rounded, relatively small mass, larger mass in the ovary, with Doppler flow that is consistent with a neoplasm. Well, if you have these appearances in a, a woman, these don't look like normal ovaries. They are rounder than a normal ovary, and we do not see the follicles. These are patients who have ultimately proven stromal tumors in association with feminizing and masculinizing symptoms. So knowing if it's masculine or feminine in terms of their symptomatology and excess hormone can help you decide which it is. But overall, I let the pathologist give me the results of what these solid tumors are. A third solid tumor can be associated with 
acoustic shadowing due to attenuation of sound and reflection of sound. And similar to lyomyoma of the ovary, these are um, fibroma, thecoma, and they're related like fibroma to the fibroid tumors, fibrous elements, and these can absorb sound as we see in these examples. So if you ever see a mass that has some shadowing that this is not what a dermoid looks like, it's coming from the solid component of the tumor, think of ovarian fibroma thecoma. And here we show you in contrast a normal ovary with its normal shape. Ovarian masses tend to be round as opposed to ovarian uh, normal ovaries which tend to be elliptical. What about metastatic tumors? About 10% of ovarian tumors arise from metastatic disease. About half or more than half come from the GI tract or the breast, and then the rest we see from other tumors. And basically, these tend to be solid or cystic with a large solid component within them. And this is Dr. Netter's depiction of a patient who has a solid tumor with some small cystic elements. Anytime you see bilaterally enlarged solid ovaries, think of metastatic disease first though, gastric cancer in this case, the so-called Krukenberg tumor, another patient with lymphoma. What about germ cell tumors? Well, they come in a variety of types. We're gonna focus on the mature dermoid, if you will, which is certainly the most common if you're dealing with an adult population. So what do these look like? Well, 18% of them up to that number are bilateral. And as the name teratoma implies, they're associated with the germ cells of a variety of types. But we tend to focus our attention on the ectodermal uh, elements or the hair or sebum within dermoids. Now, when I asked residents to tell me what's causing the secogenic area with the gradual acoustic shadowing, I often get the wrong answer. So let's think about this. It's actually the hair that is hyperechogenic with the gradual acoustic shadowing as the hairball, if you will, absorbs and reflects sound, giving you a relative gradual acoustic shadowing. The sebum is actually the liquid at body temperature. It's like taking butter or fat, or lard, Crisco, and heating it up to become liquefied at body temperature. So this is the liquid due to the sebum with varying echogenicity. Sometimes it's very echogenic, sometimes it's quite echopoor. And here we have case number six in our grouping of a classic dermoid. We're seeing a focal hairball, if you will, comparing it to the CT, making you realize that the sebaceous material is typically liquid at body temperature and has varying degrees of echogenicity within them. So you should be able to recognize these classic dermoids, but there are variations. Here we have a patient who has what looks like mural nodules in a cyst. I'm not gonna let those slide by me. That will come out fairly soon, although this one does have acoustic shadowing. If you were to do a CT in this case, each of these are dermoids within the wall of a simple cyst. These are too small to resolve even today by CT. So that is called a dermoid plug. Here we see calcification in a dermoid, very bright echo with acoustic shadowing. And that is another example of why we miss dermoids. Here we have a third case, which we have a large, what looks like a solid component, but it's really sebum filled with echogenic fluid. And here's the hairball floating in the fluid. And finally, the fourth variation that we see is here's the hairball. And these echoes are linear. If I showed you a clip, they would be undulating and sparkling. This has been published as a spaghetti sign, but I would like to suggest a better name for it. Might be a bad hair day with hair flying into the liquid of the dermoid. Four examples of variations. So what did the consensus statement say about dermoids? Initially consider doing a relatively short term, but do follow them up maybe in six to 12 months and then maybe yearly. Many dermoids are small and they do not grow and they stay there or they grow very slowly, which is why the idea was that they don't all have to come out. Fortunately, malignancy in dermoids are very rare, but not unheard of, maybe two or 3% 
will have malignant components. And when they do, these are bad actors. They often are squamous tumors in these dermoids, and these can be highly lethal. So if you see a dermoid that is growing, probably should come out. There are some unusual but specific appearances to dermoids. I had to go to the literature to find these cases. Remember I showed you the endometrioma with the fluid debris level and the debris is dependent. If you ever see a fluid debris level but the debris is superficial, think about echogenic fluid in a dermoid with the floating fat. And that's seen here and that's also seen on the CT scan. So that is distinctly unusual to have a an echogenic fluid collection in the near field and a relatively echo poor a component in the far field. Floating fat. The last unusual variation, I call these hair balls or fat balls, if you will. And here you can see, these are just case reports in the literature. This was more liquefied at body temperature and then they solidified and there's hair in these floating balls. And that is supposed to be very, uh, specific for a dermoid, but unfortunately they are rare, so the literature does not have a lot about them in there. But if you should see something like this, think about a dermoid. Now dermoids, because of the floating hairball on the fat, can be difficult to identify. And here we have such an example. In the right side, it's, we really, it's, we're really pressed to see a mass here. But if I told you clinically the woman had a right adnexal mass and you do not see the right ovary, step back and think about this case as to whether or not this could be an echogenic hairball floating on fat. Very hard to see in this kind of a clip, but if you push on it, as we're doing here on the other clip, now I think it's much more convincing that we're dealing with a focal mass because it's not being impressed upon with transducer compression and notice the subtle but definite gradual acoustic shadowing. So now we're dealing with a hairball in a dermoid. That is a very subtle finding, and I think that's why a lot of people miss seeing dermoids. So consider doing clips of a variety of types, and if you have a transducer where you're pushing and interacting with the patient, think of this as similar to doing a classic pelvic exam with your fingers, but having a picture or camera at the end of your finger. Very, very good way to pick up these dermoids. Finally, the last category, the epithelial tumors in the ovary. These arise from the surface epithelium. They come in a variety of types, serous mucinous, benign, malignant, and based on biologic behavior, some have low malignant potential. But far and away, about 90% of ovarian cancer is gonna subsequently be proven to be this type of tumor. And that is unfortunate. Um, they do have a variety of types, the serous, the mucinous. You can see Dr. Netter's picture. And these are the deadly cancers in many, many instances. This is sort of the index example of an ovarian cystadenoma. Complex, has thickening, septations, and whatnot. But notice, this is a benign cystadenoma despite its 25 centimeter size. Here's another example showing the extreme variation in these neoplasms. This too is a benign cystadenoma, but it is 11 centimeters in diameter and hence is not as worrisome um, for being a malignancy because it looks very benign being simple, but should come out because of its large size. So I don't tempt to tell a pathologist beforehand what I'm dealing with, especially if I'm dealing with a lesion that looks like this. If I see metastatic disease, and I certainly look for it, then I can suggest malignancy. But these should all come out and let the pathologist tell us what we're dealing with. Now, I just want to draw your attention to some subtle findings so that hopefully you're not going to find yourself in trouble. Here is a postmenopausal woman, and it looks like she has a simple cyst in her ovary, but I always put color on the ovaries, and in this case, I saw flow, which is an excess of what I should see in a postmenopausal ovary, which led me also to look harder, and then I see this subtle mural thickening. And this patient, therefore, has a, not a simple mass, but a mass that has a solid component and has too much blood flow. 
So she has a neoplasm in this ovary, and she should go to surgery. And this is fortunately a borderline cystadenocarcinoma. What about this next case? This is a small lesion. If it's a young woman, and this was actually a 23-year-old woman, you might be tempted to just say this is a hemorrhagic cyst and let it go. But never conclude that before you put color on. And here we can see there clearly is some blood flow within this. My colleague who did this at the Brigham, if he did do a duplex, he did not, he did not uh, photograph it, but he did for sure note that this was a, a vascularized area within this small mass and wanted the patient to come back for short-term follow-up, which she did, and there was no change. At this point, this has to come out. And fortunately for her, this was a small tumor, only a grade one, but look at her age. She was 23 years old. So this is a certainly an eye-opener, if you will, because by all rights, it should be a hemorrhagic cyst, but you can never make that conclusion before you put color on. So now, what about those cysts that we really worry about, the cancers, the malignant neoplasms? Well, these don't look anything like what we've been talking to up to now. These, if they're complex cysts, have large solid components. They do have septations. They have blood flow in the septation. They have flow in the solid components. They're thick. They're irregular septation. Often they're associated with free fluid and the free fluid carries the malignancy throughout the abdominal cavity. And since it's in malignant ascites, it shouldn't surprise you that it often affects the edge of organs like the periphery of the liver. Uh, it can directly invade the peritoneum itself, and it can cause involvement of the um, omentum, which can cause thickening, and they tend to be large. So these masses look nothing like what I showed you before. All three of these people have ovarian cancer, and it's important to recognize that it, um, the appearance just does, it looks very ominous. So these should all come out, they have flow. They really shouldn't cause you confusion because they look so different than the six lesions I've shown you. Flow in septations can't be ignored, although not will be, they will not always be due to malignancy. Fortunately for this woman, this was a benign lesion with, that was septated, and sometimes you can see that with an endometrioma, but they must come out. And finally, occasionally you can have masses that look ominous, and the pathology tells you that they are not uh, cancer, they are benign, often benign neoplasms. So here we have a case where there is ascites, there was an ovarian mass, to give you the opportunity to evaluate it further change your transducer now to a superficial transducer and realize that you're dealing with an, with an implant here in the peritoneum itself. Or go to the outside of the liver here, the periphery of the liver, that's where tumors like to go, the periphery, periphery of organs. So that is a tumor implant in a lady who has a small ovarian cancer. And here we also have a peritoneal implant in addition, so that patient has both. Here we have O mental thickening with bowel displaced away from the abdominal wall. What about this case? I believe this may be my last case. It looks like it could be complex fluid, but you can never say that because you don't know until you put color on. This component had no flow, so it's probably hemorrhagic, so you might not need to follow it. But the other component, unfortunately, was not cystic, was not complex in terms of complex cyst, was a solid mass, and this has obviously flow. We have to be worried, and therefore we were right to be worried. This patient actually presented with a primary tumor in the lung of unknown etiology, and by doing this ultrasound, we were able to say for sure that this was not a hemorrhagic process. This was a solid mass in a an ovary due to, in this case, ovarian cancer. So now we have the big six. I hope you know, as you're looking at them, to recognize them, know what to do for them, not to worry about them. Patients will often go to surgery based on their clinical presentation with these, not necessarily based on ultrasound. So to put everything into summary, premenopausal woman who has what looks like a small follicle or corpus luteum probably don't need to even report it and certainly don't need to follow it up because this is part of a normal menstrual cycle. 
As we get larger, you want to report it, but no need to do a follow-up because these should resolve on their own as functioning follicles and functioning corpus lutea. Premenopausal cyst, still unilocular, getting larger, probably do want to follow it up, make sure uh, that it is not growing, or if it is growing, and it's, uh, if it's growing, probably should come out, because these will be neoplasms, but benign, those cyst adenomas that we were discussing. Only when we get to be greater than seven centimeters should we consider taking them out, according to the people who wrote the consensus statement. Hemorrhagic cysts initially do a short-term follow-up because most likely it will be a, a functioning cyst at this point and will resolve. But if they are large, follow it up because sometimes endometriomas can also have this appearance and can cross over in their appearance with that of a hemorrhagic cyst. If you have a postmenopausal woman and you have a very small, that is less than a centimeter cyst, Consider not even mentioning it in your report. Greater than a centimeter between it and seven centimeters, do yearly follow-up because we are thinking that these are going to be benign neoplasm. That means a benign cystadenoma. If you have a hemorrhagic cyst and the woman is early postmenopausal, our gynecology clinicians urged us to do a short-term follow-up because uh, most likely, if, it if it's shortly after menopause, it may still be a functioning cyst. They mentioned that women can occasionally ovulate within five years of menopause, which came as a surprise to me. But after five years, they said you do not ovulate anymore and you would be worried about a neoplasm. Frankly, I am worried about all hemorrhagic processes after the menopause, even these early ones. Remember I said that ovarian cancer rarely hemorrhages but occasionally it can. And so I would be worried about a, a neoplasm uh, because I never want to miss a neoplasm if I, if I can help it. And finally, if you have a pre or postmenopausal process that looks like a dermoid, it probably will be one and you can follow those providing they're less than seven centimeters. If it's unilocular and large, it's going to be a benign neoplasm, such as a cystadenoma, which our pathology colleagues again suggested does not transform into a malignant cystadenocarcinoma. All the other appearances that we see, septation, mural nodules, solid masses, we will worry about a neoplasm, and those should come out because we cannot say, unless you see ascites and spread of tumor, if it's benign or malignant. That's the pathologist's job, and we're happy to let him do his job after these ovaries are removed. So fortunately, most women have ovarian ovaries that look normal. We recognize them. But when we see things that are variations or out of the normal range, we know now how to handle them. Many of these are going to be physiologic or functional processes that will go away. Some will be neoplasms, such as dermoids, that we know what they rec we recognize them, or hemorrhagic cysts, so we recognize those also and know how to treat them. I again thank Dr. Netter for his help in preparing this talk, and certainly I thank you also for your attention.